Welcome to Tax Notes Talk, a podcast from Tax Notes, the leading source of tax news, information, and analysis. Welcome to the podcast. I'm David Stewart, editor in chief of Tax Notes Today International. This week, how do you spend $80 billion? On April 6th, the IRS released its long awaited spending plan for the $80 billion allotted to it in the Inflation Reduction Act. The plan includes spending initiatives as well as budget information for the next three fiscal years. So what kind of response has the plan gotten in the tax community? Well, joining me now to talk more about this is Tax Notes senior reporter Jonathan Curry. Jonathan, welcome back to the podcast. It's good to be back, Dave. I've had a nice long paternity leave, and I am ready to talk about the big strategic operational plan. Well, we are glad to have you back. So first of all, could you give us like a quick rundown of what we saw in the plan? Yeah. So as you mentioned, it came out last week. I'll note that that was about four days after I returned from paternity leave. And while the IRS didn't say it in their press release, I'm sure they they were waiting for me to get back. And oh, I, clearly. Reading between the lines, we, mm-hmm. we know. Yeah. That, that was very, very respectful of them. But this plan, so it, yeah, it came out last Thursday. As you said, is highly anticipated. There's been a lot of talk, you know, for the last seven plus months about what's going to be in this plan. And now we have a pretty good idea of what the IRS is envisioning. A lot of it is, is fairly high level. It's not the most granular, detailed document, but it's 150 pages. I mean, granted, you know, 10 or 15 of those pages are sort of filler, you know, blank spaces or graphics and things like that. But it's, it's a fair amount of detail. And it's a pretty comprehensive thing. Just to recap again, the Inflation Reduction Act provided 80 billion, about $80 billion. And that is, the IRS was essentially given kind of like a carte blanche to do with it, whatever it sees fit, with some, you know, oversight from Congress, but also within these four buckets of funding. So the $80 billion is divided into about 45, a little over $45 billion for enforcement. And if you're you're a sharp math wizard, you'll realize that that is over half of the $80 billion going to enforcement. A little over $3 billion goes to taxpayer services, about... 25 or so billion for operations support and just shy of $5 billion for the IRS to modernize its, its IT and business systems. So the plan itself fleshes out these, what, what it's going to do in a couple different areas. Specifically, it has five key objectives. And then underneath that, it lays out different initiatives. Underneath those are divided into projects. And then those projects, a lot of them have milestones. And so it, it's a, a good amount of interesting detail there. Just to recap, though, these objectives, the first one would be the IRS wants to really expand its capabilities on the customer service side. There are already are taxpayer accounts online you can access for some basic functionality, but they want to like supercharge that to where you can do a whole lot more than before and a lot of other things along those lines. Um, they want to make it easier to contact the IRS, not just on the phone, but just through uh, messaging, uh, online messaging as well. The second objective is similar to the customer service side. It's a a taxpayer service bucket of initiatives here. And what this one is, is it's quickly resolving taxpayer issues when they arise. So the taxpayer makes a mistake and then the IRS clobbers them, you know, six months later with an audit notice or something like that. They want to do things like automatically fixing a taxpayer's return that has a a pretty clear math error. Mm -hmm. Uh, So rather than something that triggers like it having to get it extra scrutiny. It can just be quick, fixed quickly and easily without draw, you know, causing a fuss. They also want to make it easier for taxpayers to set up you know, installment agreements to pay back taxes if they owe taxes. So it's not this complicated procedure. And they already have a lot of these things kind of in place currently, but they just want to expand it, make it more accessible, more easier to understand. The third objective is boosting enforcement, and the Biden administration has been very clear that they want to stick by the capital P pledge. <laughs> that has become sort of a bit of a, a famous talked about thing here, where Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen and President Biden have pledged not to raise the audit rate on those earning less than $400,000 relative to historic norms. And they really emphasize that they're going to be using this enforcement money to go after high net worth taxpayers with complicated tax situations. And that's where they're going to try to close the tax gap between taxes that are owed and taxes that are actually paid. They also want to modernize the IRS's technology. It's sort of, the IRS is sort of infamous in the government world for its, its outdated systems. And yes, they have made a lot of updates along the, the years. There's a common talking point that it's database is based off of 1960s technology. And there's, there's, there's some truth there, but it's also not, not entirely a fair picture necessarily. But they do want to fully modernize their systems where that talking point just disappears completely. 
They want to replace the master file database. They want to use data to target their audits more carefully so they're not targeting taxpayers who are compliant, but actually getting finding taxpayers who are non-compliant. And then the last objective, number five, is they want to hire a more skilled and kind of like diversely skilled workforce as well. Another interesting thing about the plan, too, it emphasizes taxpayer service. And if you recall what I just talked about with the budget breakdown, the taxpayer service was technically only given a little over $3 billion in this plan, but it takes up taxpayer service projects take up about, I think, around 40% of the actual document itself. So they are clearly emphasizing that this is going to be good for the average taxpayer, but they've also pointed out that all these plans on the taxpayer service side might start to run out of funding pretty quickly, <laughs> even with the extra $80 billion because of the restrictions on how it can be spent in those buckets. So there's a lot to unpack there, but I had a good conversation today with someone who's going to do that for us. Let's get to that. So tell us about your guest. Yeah, so I had the privilege of talking to the illustrious Fred Goldberg Jr. from Skadden. He's had a very, he's had a long and busy career in the tax world. Perhaps most relevant for our conversation today is that he is a former IRS commissioner himself. He was an IRS commissioner from 1989 to 1992. But he's also held roles like IRS chief counsel, treasury assistant secretary for tax policy. And he's he's definitely a fixture in the tax world that has a lot of good insight for especially for this topic that we're talking about today. Great. And what sort of things did you get into? Yeah. So he I I don't want to spoil too much. Uh, (laughs) You'll realize he's he's impressed with what he sees in the plan. He likes what the IRS that he thinks they have a cohesive vision. And he sees some some notable shifts in how the IRS is, is approaching tax administration uh, and, and then also a lot of it is about the IRS doing more of what it's already doing now, but doing it so much better than what it, it's been doing. Uh, and he thinks that's going to have a pretty big impact on both the average taxpayer and the wealthiest, you know, the big IBMs and Boeing, you know, corporations of the world as well. Well, all right. Let's go to that interview. All right. Well, Fred, thank you for being with us here today. Thanks, Jonathan. It's a treat to be here. I've been a Tax Notes fan from the very beginning. So it's a pleasure. Yeah, no, same here. And a great topic. Yeah, absolutely. Very relevant right now. <laughs> kind of a hot topic these days. So let's just dive right in. So we have this new strategic operational plan. It came out last Thursday, April 6. And I would love to kind of start with your high-level 30,000-foot view on the plan. Do you think, you know, the IRS had about a little over six months, about seven, well, more like seven months to to kind of game out the their plan on this. Does it look like they were just kicking back with their heels on the table, or do you think that they put a lot of, does it show signs of a lot of, a lot of thought? It's an extraordinary document, truly extraordinary. And it's worth the hours that it takes to go through it carefully and think about what they're saying. And they wisely waited till after the commissioner was confirmed because that's his job. They picked the right guy, but he has to have some input, and he did. From at a high level, it reflects what the career organization has known for years and years and years should be done, needs to be done, but for lots of reasons, it didn't a lot of it didn't happen. It was funding issues, different technologies and all. But it captures a comprehensive view of how the IRS sees itself going forward. And that is terrific. It's also aligned with the commissioner's he's a, he's a great leadership skills, and he's, he's the right guy for the job. And the plan is aligned with broadly, at a high level, how he sees the system. So it's terrific, but you need to read it. You can't skim it. You can't generalize because there's so much going on there. It's terrific. I thought you made a good point, an interesting point that it's not like the IRS just sat down last August after the, you know, the bill was enacted to just start from scratch, essentially. A lot of these things have been on the table for a long time, and now it's being sort of pushed together, mashed, you know, mushed together into this one document. Isn't that, right. Isn't that and, right. And as Secretary Yellen likes to describe it, it's stable funding. Other folks refer to it as long-term funding. This is the chance. In a, in a very real way, the IRS has never had this chance before. What differentiates Commissioner Werfel from all the rest of us? There's stable funding, and that's what makes this happen, or can let this happen. 
if you look at this plan, there's a lot of good things. They have nice graphics showing, you know, the, the IRS of the future, people uh, using their phones to access an online taxpayer account. And they talk about all kinds of, you know, shifts on, you know, technology and modernization. And it's a happy sounding IRS, got to say. It's a pretty optimistic vision. But a vision is still a vision. Do you, as a former IRS commissioner yourself, do you see this as a realistic and achievable plan? I think the at least the way to think about it, as an abstract matter, most of what is here, oh, I get this, this makes sense, but that doesn't really answer the question. The way I see it, there are two risks and three challenges. The two risks have to do with protecting taxpayer information and confidentiality and setting priorities. The three challenges are around services enforcement and HR. Protecting confidentiality and private. Every month we're reading about private sector issues, government issues. If you actually look at the record, the IRS has done a very good job. It's been strangely silent about ProPublica, but they got to do the best they can because that's what taxpayers have every right to expect. And they got to improve as technology improves. Very little room for error, if it sounds like, because when well, that, the, you know, ProPublica leak came out, hearings were called, and one mistake starts a sort of a snowball effect well, of attention. Mm, yeah, but it goes to candor and expressing anger and outrage and chasing the folks who are doing it. You know, ask all 300 million of us who's perfect. Nobody's going to raise their hand, but it's, it's a very high priority, and that's clear throughout the plan. When you get to priorities... The plan has five objectives, it has 42 initiatives, and it has 192 key projects. Well, that tells you a lot. There is no way they can do all of them at once. Mm -hmm. Not a chance. Yeah. And if you decide to do, well, do a little bit of all 192, it's still not going to work. You need to set priorities. You also, it's important for those outside the IRS to understand the profound difference between honest, candid oversight, support, and micromanaging. Micromanaging can be a big hindrance to this entire thing. When you get to priorities, Commissioner Werfel's history, the time some of us have been privileged to spend with him, he gets the need to set priorities. A number of his most senior staff and staff he's going to be bringing in understand you need to set priorities. And, and just the, to clarify, Commissioner Werfel was a, a former IRS commissioner, acting commissioner for a, a brief a spell, period of And time. he also spent a lot of time in management consulting. Yeah, well. and dealing with governments. But he's a smart guy. And the priorities is a practical matter. And I think the judgment of most of us who see this, get the service portion right. They've already started doing it. It is transformational, and they can get it up and running. Several of them are already up and running, and they really got two years to show they know how to do what they're doing. And that's where the focus, at least most of us believe the focus should be. Yeah, to your point, the filing season last year and the, even the year before as well, I mean, I don't know many people would say anything more kindly than it was a disaster. <laughs> uh, uh, and this year, there hasn't been nearly as much Jonathan, uh, some attention. of us would say... The fact that they kept the filing season together at all was spectacular. Sure, credit and where but credit's for, due. But for electric, you know, yeah. accounting filing, it would have failed, completely failed. So, yes, it was a disaster in terms of service, in terms of processing times. But the most likely alternative was complete collapse. And I think they deserve some credit for that. Support for this podcast is provided by Practicing Law Institute. Check out Practicing Law Institute's tax planning program taking place this spring. This popular three-day event brings together esteemed faculty for an insightful review of the legislative, regulatory, and judicial developments in Subchapter K and important partnership transactions, controversies, and trends. For more details and to register, visit pli.edu slash taxplanning23. That's pli.edu slash taxplanning23. 
You also mentioned the threat of micromanagement. Would you say the threat is more from Congress or from the Biden administration, like say Treasury? It's all the stakeholders because there's a difference between hard oversight accompanied by complete candor, which Commissioner Werfel is committed to. And oversight is so important. And he said that from day one. And that matters. And support structures, whether it's funding or whether it's Treasury using its resource, they play a very important role on compliance through guidance, for example. But micromanaging never works. And it's hard to resist the temptation. You know, if you're on a board of a company, don't micromanage the CEO. Oversight, stewardship, support. And it's sort of human nature. Well, I know all this stuff. I'm going to tell you everything you should do. But he needs the independence, whether it's personnel or whether it's specific priorities and how they're executed. That's his job. And that's leadership's job. Let him do it, but pay attention Mm -hmm. and be honest about it. You also raised hiring challenges. One of the objectives is to hire a skilled, diverse workforce with a sort of a range of talents that the IRS hasn't really been using yet. But you seem to be suggesting that might not be as easy as it sounds on paper. The way I see it, there are two risks. Massive leaks, unattended to, not given its priority. That is a huge risk. Failure to set and execute priorities is a huge risk. But then there are three sort of operational issues. HR, a lot of the stuff they say is really good. It feels good. It makes sense. But it is really hard to do. And a lot of it is hard to assess. Like this very interesting thing about culture, moving to a culture of service and support. That's great. That's great. How do you measure it? How do you do it? That's kind of tricky. The hiring challenge is because of the bureaucratic rules, the external rules is hard. And I, I just think that's a one of the three biggest challenges. On the service side, you can sort of break the services into two buckets. One are things that are doable, are measurable, quantifiable in terms of impact, and can therefore be improved over time. And that's a meaningful number of the key initiatives, right? or key projects, rather. Some of the service projects are important, but hard. How do you measure whether communication is easier and more easily understood? That's been something all of us have talked about for 40 years. It's not that it shouldn't happen. It's harder to do, and its impact is harder to measure. So thinking about these key projects... You want to think about which ones you do, which ones you prioritize, because if you can't measure it and assess its impact and treat that as the foundation for how am I going to do better next year and then the next year, because the whole theory of transformation is you start. You don't start with a perfect, you never start with a perfect answer. You start with an answer, improve, improve, improve. Some of the service pieces are harder to measure and therefore figure out how you improve. On the compliance side, the the issue is the word enforcement. Folks equate enforcement equals audits. Now, the background for that is how the CBO and OTA score. They're following. The CBO is one of the most remarkable institutions we have in our government. OTA is terrific professionals. They don't score the impact of technology, they don't score the impact of service, and they don't score changing ways of doing business. Well, that's what this whole plan's about. And it's a convention that in some ways is understandable. But if this is all about revenue, which is a part of it, enforcement. Well, enforcement is just audits. That is not compliance. Enforcement is never an end in itself. Enforcement is one way to improve compliance, and you need it. Civil and criminal audits are important, but it's only one. And what's beautiful about the plan is you read the plan, and the IRS is so clear-sighted about all the other strategies. In a global world with what's going on on international taxes, the, the 
advanced pricing and mutual agreements to resolve issues is a spectacular tool for yeah. compliance. Global resolutions, if thousands of taxpayers have done something that was too hinky, you can really audit every one of them, litigate all those cases for the next 20 years, or are you going to come up with viable global, global resolutions? There are other tools. Guidance is so important. Again, would you rather find something that you don't think makes any sense? Audit, go to appeals, go to court and roll your dice for 10 years on a court decision? Or would you rather have Treasury provide guidance? Folks, don't do this anymore. Form redesign is another tool so that if you read the plan carefully, the IRS totally gets that. But when you say enforcement, which is what is relevant for scoring, which is historic audit results, it's understandable because that's the way the rules are crafted. But that's – I get worried about that word because, oh, you're just going to go audit everybody. No, that's not what the IRS is going to do. It's not part of their plan. It is an important part of their plan but a subset of a much broader approach. Now, for example, uh, Natasha Saran, the former uh, Treasury uh, counsel, she was the counselor to Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. She tweeted when the plan was released. She worked on the plan extensively and was you know, part and parcel of putting the, the Inflation Reduction Act together. You know, she described the shift in the IRS's approach or mindset towards compliance as a fundamental shift in how the IRS sees compliance. It's less about like penalizing taxpayers when they get it wrong and more about helping taxpayers get it right up front or shortly after they file to avoid like these long drawn out fights. Do you see that as I mean, would you agree that that sounds like a fundamental shift for the agency? I wouldn't say it's a fundamental shift in the sense they're doing things they've never done before. I think the shift is in prioritizing their entire set of ways of improving yeah. compliance. I think a culture that says enforcement equals audit and audit is our preferred approach, that's always been true. But if you read the plan, they're doing APMA already. Treasury is doing guidance already. They, they at least historically had done – you know, they've done all of these things, but it's what you put priorities on. And Natasha's terrific. I mean, she is amazing. And one of the HR objectives is a culture of service and support. So is it different or is it making far better use and giving far greater priority to tools they've already used in some – I would put it the latter way, but it's a big change. So, Fred – Commissioner Werfel said the agency wants to leverage technology and automation. They want to bring in data scientists and they really want to change how the, the IRS does things kind of within, you know, internally. One of the criticisms the plan got was, for example, that it only provides projections of, of staffing, you know, how many people wants to hire for the next two years. Commissioner Werfel explained that as saying, we want to see where we're at and then based on how, you know, where we're more efficient, that'll change, you know, what needs we need to fill on, on the staffing front. Do you think it's doable for the IRS to be able to, to really make some big changes internally, you just simply using technology, data, to really change, you know, almost like the composition of the IRS staff? Short answer, yes. I think that the criticisms about there are not enough details, they're not projections, criticisms the IRS doesn't know what it's doing and screws up, you know, there are all these criticisms out there. They're completely unfounded in my view because the reality, the real world of transformational change in the private sector is you learn as you go. You're doing something different because you want to accomplish something. Well, once you're doing something different, it improves over time. And it goes back to the service stuff. Do stuff that you can measure and show it works and show how you can improve it. And so I, I think that you sort of wonder – I mean some of the, some of the critics are – love the service, love the system, are very well intended. But I think that, that understanding transitional change in a very large organization where technology is one of the most important drivers and as you say, the workforce skills is going to – needs are going to change over time. It's hard and it takes – the beauty of all this, if you read carefully, 
like, for example, the, the tree projects, if you read them fairly and carefully, there is both explicit and implicit acknowledgement, this will take time and we need to improve. That gets you back to priorities. If they're trying to do every one of these right now or bits and pieces of every one, it's just not going to work. But Mr. Werfel understands it. Senior staff understands it. So I, I just don't think those criticisms are grounded in reality. We did a – Commissioner Rosati, Commissioner Koskin, and myself published an article in the best publication in the country, Tax Notes. Oh, yeah. So, so on, March, on March 13th. And it lays out five initiatives – that are already underway, already underway, that objectively will transform how tens of millions of taxpayers will deal with the IRS. It's stunning. Are they perfect? No. Will they improve and improve and improve? They can, yes. Can you measure the impact by counting the taxpayers, getting feedback from taxpayers and practitioners? Absolutely. Well, if you really think you better put some points on the board over the next year or two, they're there for the taking. And I think the service understands that. And these are the ones that taxpayers and advisors care about most. Electronic posting of data, converting paper to digital, self-help, get your collection, being able to do your offer and compromise to make payments, phone calls answered the first time, and you set the terms. Being able to resolve office, uh, you know, correspondence and desk audits with one person where yeah. you can post the documents, where you can see your file. It's hard to capture how different that's going to be for folks. And it's measurable and it's doable. Yeah, it's very interesting. You point out a lot of these things like the electronically sharing documents, setting up these installment uh, agreements, you know, over the phone. I mean, those have been tools that the IRS has been working on. And it sounds like a lot of what this plan is doing is taking what they've been doing and just like supercharging it, you know, making we're making it more robust. Like they have online taxpayer accounts where you can check some basic functionality, but they want to make it more robust so that now you can actually interact or post documents or receive notices electronically. And getting rid of the paper trail, that oftentimes is where a lot of bottlenecks and things break down where it's like, well, I, I didn't get that letter. Exactly, Jonathan. And the Secretary Yellen puts it, stable funding, others call it long. That's the only way this can really work. But they got to start showing results. One of my favorite little things in this is taxpayer and practitioner use of technology is optional. That's why electronic filing. Folks don't like to be ordered to do things by their government. They like to have control. And electronic filing worked because it was never mandated. And over time, folks got comfortable with it. IDME didn't work because everyone was told they had to use it. Folks don't do that. The new system they're going to, and if you read the plan time and again, it's optional. That works for us. All of, you know, that's, that's sort of our national character. Yeah. Don't tread on me. <laughs> so I, I think that, that shows a really important understanding that has been expressly articulated. Support for this podcast is provided by the Fifth Annual UCI Law Tax Symposium, Taxation of Crypto Assets. Join us for a full-day virtual symposium that will be held on Monday, April 17th. This event will address current developments in the taxation of crypto assets in the United States and abroad. James Lee, Chief of IRS Criminal Investigation, will deliver the keynote. This event is approved for continuing legal education credit by the State Bar of California. Registration is free. To register for the symposium, please visit law.uci.edu slash gradtax slash events. That's law.uci.edu slash gradtax slash events. You would touch on this a little bit earlier, but the, the criticisms of the plan. We'll go over a few of the, the criticisms that have been out there, whether it's, for, like you mentioned, some of it is, is sort of politically charged, others are from people who are fairly trying to get the IRS where they want it to go. One of the criticisms I've seen often is that the plan includes around 200 or so milestones. So they have all these projects. Then they have milestones like we're going to finish. You know, success looks like 
rolling out a taxpayer account where they can send emails directly to an auditor by you know fiscal 2024. I'm, I'm making that up, but you know something like that where it's it's sort of a here's our benchmark that we're setting for ourselves. But some of the criticism was that a lot of these milestones are a bit vague, like it's just improved customer service by fiscal year 2023 or something like that. How would you respond to the, the criticism that the plan is a bit vague and, and a lot of these objectives are sort of unquantifiable? I, I think that and this is why reading the plan, and it's ours, to try to get your, get your head around what's really going on here. And if the way, at least the way I read the milestones, the way I read the key projects, there is not a point in time on December 31st of 2025 when we will have achieved perfection and we're done. It doesn't work that way. And I think that, that the lack of specificity is both appropriate and realistic. Technology is changing at light speed. Nobody knows what technology is going to be like in two or three years and how it facilitates the kind of work the IRS is trying to do. So I, I think that's the answer to that question is you would be foolhardy. It would be affirmatively misleading saying we will hire this number of people each year for 10 years. This is the technology we're going to use for the next 10 years. This is exactly the number of good things that are going to happen to this number. Nobody knows. Nobody in the private sector knows when they're trying to transform their business. So I, I just don't think that criticism, it's well intended sometimes. It's publicly politics in our current environment. But treating taxpayers right and giving service, that is about as bipartisan an issue as you can have. And if folks should do their job. Congress has to play a fundamental role in accountability and oversight. I don't know if I'm answering your question. I just don't buy that. The approach they are taking at this stage strikes me as practical and reasonable. Another criticism I've heard, this one's a little more from the, the stauncher critics of the IRS, is that the IRS it has $80 billion to spend and it is just in over its head and there's no way it's not going to screw this up. Do you think that things are different this time around? The IRS has had some, some notable failures in the past when it comes to some things where it's gotten extra funding for modernizing things and it just hasn't really delivered the way Congress perhaps envisioned it would. What's different this time? What is profoundly different, thank you, Secretary Yellen, for the way you clarified. She's absolutely right. It is stable funding. And we all live in an annual accounting period for tax purposes. That's when we file our returns. But transformative change doesn't happen to the tax year. It happens over time. And I think that what is fundamentally different is the stable funding, coupled with a clear picture that includes things. It's optional, not mandatory. We listen to outsiders. We're open to change. We're open to feedback. And I think all of those things are true, and a fair reading of the plan tells you they're true. That's what's different this time. It makes it possible. Imagine running tax notes. Imagine running IBM. Imagine running Duck and Donuts. No idea what your budget's going to be next year. None. Zero. Could you run any of these organizations that way? Not a chance. And that's the big difference. Another key issue that's come up surrounding this is where things stand with the pledge. And if you've been following, you know, the developments around this, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act, President Biden and Secretary Janet Yellen, they've pledged that audit rates on those earning less than $400,000 will, will not increase relative to historic norms. They've certainly been a little bit cagey perhaps in the past about what a historic norm they're really going by. But Commissioner Warfel has also emphasized that you know, audit rates he said that all their attention is going to be focused on this high net worth segment of the population, big corporations, when it comes to spending this new enforcement. Do you think that that should sort of satisfy critics or, or satisfy concerns that the IRS is going to be going after mom and pop down the street? I don't know. There was a president at one point who said, trust but verify. I think that Commissioner Orfel over the last couple of weeks has been absolutely clear. We're not going to be playing games. And there is no way that 
audit coverage for those making less than $400,000 is going to anywhere near approach the historic audit coverage. This is not, well, I'm going to pick the highest audit coverage you've ever been, and that's going to be my benchmark. That's a game. He's not playing those games, and he has been quite explicit about not playing those games, and that's reassuring. I think the high end, I think the biggest challenge there is they want to hire folks who can do this, but I think they have so much to learn about compliance issues at the high end that I would not go crazy with the hiring of agents. I would spend my time doing the research to understand what I don't know, but what I do need to know to be effective. And that is both identifying issues and finding the most effective way to deal with those issues. Sometimes it's an audit, sometimes it's penalties, sometimes it's criminal enforcement. But I think an awful lot of the time it comes to things like guidance, innovative dispute resolutions, and, and I think the service, I would be paying a lot of attention first to figure out what am I looking at here? What are the issues and how do I deal with them? Because I think they've got a lot to learn. Part of the reason they have a lot to learn is they just haven't been auditing these organizations and they are not provided with the base data. And time and again, the agent comes out and they have not been told what they're looking at. So they can do discovery and tell the big company or the partnership or whatever, how are you structured and what's it all look like? But the IRS has, can get or has most of that data. And in a world where you can equip agents with that information and you can assess the information based on your understanding of compliance issues, you're going to dramatically reduce the no-change audits rate. And you're going to do a better job with the ones you do. But that's hard. It's going to take time. And promising what it's going to look like and promising exactly when you're going to audit how many folks and how much you're going to collect is nonsense. And the criticisms, it's, they're understandable, but you sort of wonder, are those making those criticisms, how familiar are they with businesses that are pursuing transformational change with technology and a more robust workforce. And one of, the, one of the beauties of this whole thing, Jonathan, is I've lived in the tax world for 50 years, but Commissioner Rosati, Commissioner Koskinen, to some extent Commissioner Everson, have lived in a world of business. They're not tax folks. And their insights on how real business succeeds and works is invaluable. Just to sort of wrap up our conversation here, the one final question for you. Commissioner Warfel is the new commissioner. He'll be serving a five-year term, or at most a five-year term, as long as he wants the job, I suppose. Maybe two five-year terms. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe, that's true. <laughs> that's that's a true. 10-year funding. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Maybe he'll do so well. They just want to keep him around. Now, you've sat in the commissioner's seat before as well in the early 90s. Looking at where he is now, do you envy the job that he has right now or, you know, that he has $80 billion to essentially play around with and create the agency he desires? Or, or is it more of a pity knowing that there might be a bit of a political target painted on his back for as long as he's sitting in that chair at 1111 Constitution Avenue? You get a lot of questions. Why would anybody in the right mind want to do this? The IRS is the only institution in this country where every one of us, rich, poor, any de de definition, business, small business, big business, international business, nonprofits, religious organizations. My executor, when I die, has to deal with the IRS. And getting that right is so important to our country because it's the one shared experience. The chance to finally be able to do that with stable, long-term funding, and with technology where it has gone over the last 10 years and where it is likely to go for better as well as for worse over the next period. Jonathan, this can happen, and it's so important. And whether it's been your life for 50 years or whether it's been folks who understand and run extraordinarily successful businesses who've served, 
you know, got to give me 30 years back. But I'd love to do the job. And yeah. I think most of us feel that way. Is it going to be hard? Are we going to constantly have a target on our back, his back? For sure. But the good that could be done, and a guy who I think understands how to do it, of course he wants a job. Well, Fred, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure talking with you. And Jonathan, it's been such a treat being here. Texanos really does something important. And thanks for letting me do this. And now, coming attractions. Each week we highlight new and interesting commentary in our magazines. Joining me now is Executive Editor for Commentary, Jasper Smith. Jasper, what will you have for us? Thanks, Dave. In Tax Notes Federal, Jason Chin explores the ways that ChatGPT could transform the tax profession. James Atkinson explores the tax planning significance of the tangible property regulations under Sections 162 and 263A. In Tax Notes State, Carl Frieden and Douglas Lindholm critique the policy arguments made in favor of a permanent digital services tax at the state level in the United States. Open Weaver Banks provides some highlights of New Jersey's unitary business case law and discusses the state's new statutory and regulatory definitions of a unitary business. In Tax Notes International, Robert Goulder comments on a new research paper addressing account-level FATCA data. Thomas Horst shares his method for estimating the unrecognized tax benefit clawback rate by evaluating generally accepted accounting principles financial statement data. In featured analysis, Joseph Thorndike examines President Richard Nixon's shock speech of 1971 that proposed tax cuts, wage freezes, price controls, and suspended the convertibility of the U.S. dollar to gold in an effort to fight inflation. And finally, on the opinions page, Marie Sapiri examines public comments on the Inflation Reduction Act, Section 6417, direct pay provision. Robert Goulder and Professor Mitchell Franklin discuss college sports programs' not-for-profit status in light of compensation for name, image, and likeness rights. That's it for this week. You can follow me online at taxstew, that's S-T-E-W, and be sure to follow at Tax Notes for all things tax. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions for a future episode, you can email us at podcast at taxanalyst.org. And as always, if you like what we're doing here, please leave a rating or review wherever you download this podcast. We'll be back next week with another episode of Tax Notes Talk. Tax Notes Talk is a production of Tax Notes. You can learn more about us by visiting www.taxnotes.com slash podcast. When major media wants the straight story, they turn to Tax Notes. Thank you for listening, and join us again for another edition of Tax Notes Talk. Want to see more like this? Subscribe for more tax videos. Special thanks to our executive producers, Jasper Smith and Paige Jones, as well as showrunner and audio engineer, Jordan Parrish.